Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us uh, this afternoon, this morning, this evening, depending on where you are sitting at the moment. Uh, my name is Deborah Shushan, and I am the Director of Policy at J Street, and I have the privilege of leading up the J Street Policy Center. Uh, and uh, we are pleased to host this webinar today on the spiraling situation in the West Bank. Uh, we, of course, all of us have had for the past 11 months, uh, our eyes trained very closely on uh, the situation in Gaza following Hamas's horrific attack um, on Israel on October 7th of last year. At the same time, uh, we at J Street uh, have uh, tried to really keep an eye very closely on the situation in the West Bank which we know has continued to escalate over the past 11 months uh, with at some point uh, um, there are you know, many experts who are referring to the situation as the gazification of the West Bank. And uh, many, including, uh, including us, have been warning of the potential for really a full-blown conflagration in the West Bank um, opening up another front on Israel's war, uh, in Israel's war, which of course at this point is focused in Gaza, but also a uh, lot of regional aspects, as we know, including in the north with Lebanon uh, as well. So we know that Israeli settler violence uh, and Palestinian extremism in the West Bank are both on the rise. We've seen major uh, events, uh, which have been called even by uh, Israeli security personnel, senior security personnel, pogroms that have occurred in the West Bank towns, uh, including just last month in Jit uh, in 2023. Uh, there was a, a huge one, of course, in the town of Hawara. And uh, the IDF has also been extremely active in the West Bank, uh, even prior to uh, the attack of October 7th by Hamas, uh, the IDF was responding uh, in the West Bank to the rise of Palestinian extremism uh, with what it called Operation Break the Wave uh, in 2022 and 23. Uh, and uh, subsequently, we now have what the IDF is calling uh, Operation Summer Camps, uh, very major actions by the IDF in the West Bank. As a result of all of the above, uh, we have a situation in which at least 622 Palestinians have been killed in the West Bank. That's just since October 7th. Uh, and uh, the vast majority of those have been killed by Israeli forces. Uh, 11 of them have been killed by Israeli settlers. Meanwhile, uh, 15 Israelis, including nine members of the IDF and five settlers, have been killed by Palestinians in the West Bank. Now, another development that I know uh, we are all, uh, particularly here in the United States, really keenly aware of uh, is the very recent killing of Aishinor Agi, uh, who was participating in a protest uh, at an illegal outpost in the West Bank, the outpost of Eviatar, uh, which thanks to Finance Minister Betzalel Smotrich, it's one of those that is slated for uh, regularization uh, by the Israeli government. Uh, the Biden administration has indicated that it expects a full investigation by the IDF uh, and also has raised concerns about the IDF's uh, rules of engagement in the West Bank certainly not the first time that the administration has done that, nor is this the first American citizen uh, who has been killed in the West Bank. Uh, there have been others, including, of course, Shireen Abu Akleh, uh, as well as Omar Assad. Uh, further developments, just to kind of set the scene of where we are right now, uh, over the summer, back in July, the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, ruled that Israeli occupation in the West Bank is in fact illegal, that it amounts uh, in at least some parts to annexation and that it should end as rapidly as possible. Uh, and there are further steps coming out of that decision, including 
a vote by the UN General Assembly on uh, a resolution that's being brought by the Arab group in the UN. We expect that to happen next week. So our discussion today is going to focus on the situation on the ground in the West Bank, uh, the historic ICJ ruling and what we expect to come out of that uh, and the policy options that are available to the United States and the international community. I do just want to note a few resources uh, that the J Street Policy Center has available for you on these topics. We have a hot off the presses column, uh, Shushan Street column that I wrote, uh, which is calling for US sanctions uh, a, under the executive order that was issued by President Biden in February on Finance Minister Betzalel Smotrich, as well as National Security Minister Itzamar Ben-Gvir. And it also calls for sanctions on key entities that are promoting annexation, settler violence, uh, and settlement expansion, uh, including the Settlement Division of the World Zionist Organization, Amana, and Betzalel Smotrich's organization, Regavim. Uh, so it would be wonderful if folks wanted to check that out. Uh, it has just been posted on our J Street Policy Center webpage, uh, and it is also being posted by my colleague here as well. So thank you so much for that. That's available for you. Um, we also have an issue brief on the situation in the West Bank. Uh, which can be is you know addresses many of these issues and can be a helpful backgrounder for you as well. Um, and I encourage you, generally speaking, to have a look uh, at our J Street Policy Center webpage and all of the resources we have there. We're going to also have a fact sheet specifically on Smotrich and Ben Gvir that uh, I expect to have posted uh, a little bit later today. So that will be there for you as well. Also on our webpage, but in addition to that, on our YouTube channel, you can find recordings of all of our J Street Policy Center webinars, uh, and the recording of this discussion will be available later today uh, on our YouTube, ch YouTube channel and also on the Policy Center webpage. Uh, and our comms team, my wonderful colleagues on the comms team, are going to be turning that into a podcast as well. Uh, if that's how you like to listen to your webinars and share them with friends, we also have that option. Okay, as I round out uh, this introduction here to our webinar today, uh, let me also mention that as we always do with our Policy Center webinars, we will have time later on in the webinar for your questions for our expert panelists. And so I encourage you, uh, and I see that some folks are already doing this before we have even started with our panelists, um, you can go to the Q&A at the bottom of your screen uh, and put in questions for our panelists, and uh, we will get to as many of those as we possibly can. So now let me get to it and introduce our expert guest speakers who we are just so delighted to have with us today. I'm going to start with Lior Amichai. Uh, he is the executive director of Israel's preeminent peace movement, which is Shalom Achshav, Peace Now. Um, Lior previously served as the executive director of the Israeli human rights organization Yesh Din. Uh, and before that, uh, he co-headed Peace Now, Shalom Akshav Settlement Watch project, and was responsible for exposing and analyzing the expansion of Israeli settlements in the occupied Palestinian territories. Obviously, uh, Peace Now Settlement Watch uh, remains really uh, the expert source uh, for what's going on in the West Bank uh, in terms of settlements, uh, outposts, settlement expansion. So. Uh, we thank Lior so much for joining us today. Uh, our next panelist that I want to introduce is none other than Mikhail Svard. Uh, Mikhail is a leading Israeli human rights lawyer, 
uh, who I'm sure is known to many of you, including uh, for his very important book, The Wall and the Gate, Israel, Palestine, and the Legal Battle for Human Rights. He serves as the legal advisor for a number of Israeli uh, human rights organizations, human rights anti-occupation organizations, and they include Breaking the Silence, uh, Peace Now, Yesh Dean, and the Human Rights Defenders Fund. Mikhail regularly represents Palestinian communities and Israeli and Palestinian activists in Israeli courts, and his writing on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and on human rights law uh, has appeared in publications including the New York Times, Haaretz, The Independent, and Foreign Policy. And so we are so glad to have Mikhail with us today as well. And last but certainly not least, we also have Celine Tuboul. She is co-executive director of ECF, the Economic Cooperation Foundation, and she leads ECF's policy efforts related to the Israeli-Palestinian peace process, as well as ECF's work on regional policy issues and Gaza-related issues. Celine is also a member of the excellently titled Forum Debra, an Israeli forum working to enhance the role of women in foreign policy and national security. Very important thing to do. And she is a member of the Geneva Initiative Board and a member of the Commanders for Israel Security Working Group on Gaza. Celine previously worked at the NATO Defense College and at Israel's Ministry of Justice. Thank you so much to all of our excellent panelists for joining us today uh, and for sharing with us your expertise. So as we dive right in, I'd like to get a little bit of an overview of what the situation on the ground looks like uh, in the West Bank right now. And for that, I would love to turn to first to Lior Amichai. So Lior, can we turn to you for an overview from your perspective of what the situation on the West Bank looks like on the ground? Thank you, Deborah, and thank you for all the participants uh, for joining us today. And, and thank you, J Street, for your really important work, especially during these times. Uh, I'll say in a nutshell that Peace Now, we have two major operations. One of them is that we try to represent the Israeli public that wants to have a Palestinian state, a two-state solution to end the occupation. And the other operation is really to know what's, what's happening on the ground, our settlement watch project. And I'm really excited about this uh, invitation to speak to you today because while there's so much drama going on in Gaza and in the border with Lebanon and also in the Israeli society, there's certainly a lot of drama that's happening in the West Bank. I'll, I'll say that even more uh, deterministic in saying that we are certain that the politicians from the right wing, Smotrich and Ben Gvir, and perhaps even also Netanyahu, they have one mission in mind, one major agenda. Their, their, their major objection is, and that is to annex the Palestinian territories and to prevent the Palestinian state and to prevent the two-state solution, and they're continuing to do so. Uh, since this war began, we are seeing three major trends and maybe two major consequences. Uh, the three major trends are in underground, are in the de jure annexation, and in the finances. Uh, and, and maybe I'll just have like, a, I'll try really briefly to sort of just list them. Uh, and, and of course, if you want to delve into any of them more specifically, we can. Uh, first and foremost, what is most evident is that we're seeing on the ground 35, about 35 new outposts that emerged since October 7. So uh, if you're, you know, 35 new outposts, that means 35 new spots on hilltops surrounded or secured by officers, military soldiers uh, taking Palestinian lands and perhaps contributing directly to settler violence. And none of them, of course, are being uh, demolished or, or something on the contrary. They're, they're growing. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give here a scoop uh, that I think nobody knows yet and hopefully uh, will get published soon, is one of these outposts was recently published entirely in Area B. So I don't know. This has never happened before. We've seen in the past uh, uh, some outposts, few, very few, expanded into Area B. Uh, but they were demolished. Uh, so it, it, here we have an outpost that was established several weeks ago entirely in Area B, something new. And, and 
nothing is happening. So uh, a lot of drama in the outpost that's happening. Lior, I uh, want to jump in for, for just a second. Uh, for folks yeah. who may not be aware of the distinction between Area C, where settlements and outposts are, versus what you're talking about, Area B, can you just explain that very quickly? Yeah, and, and I, I I think it's really in the details, and and it doesn't really matter, like for in, in the broader sense. But you know, since the Oslo, since the 1990s, we have this sort of division of areas A, B, and C, where areas A and B are roughly controlled uh, by the Palestinian Authority to certain extents, and Area C is still direct Israeli military occupation on all levels, and all of the settlements are in Area C. This is the area that comprises of 60% of the West Bank. It spreads out the entire West Bank. It surrounds the Palestinian towns and cities and, and, and villages. And that's where the settlements and, and outposts are being expanded. And even the settlers have termed like the, the period as you know the fight over Area C. We are now trying to take as much of Area C as possible. Uh, one of the trends that we're seeing is that this is moving on to Area B as well. And, and and certainly we're seeing this with the establishment of this outpost and with the complete ignoring of the uh, Israeli defense uh, or the Israeli military from doing anything against this outpost, which is there for, for several weeks now. No, but uh, I hope that this is fine, Deborah. You want me area A, B, a, B and C? Now, uh, I'll, I'll say I'll, I'll run this through because uh, I think uh, once you're sitting in the panel with Celine and Michael, you will also want to let them speak. And if I'll run the whole list really quickly, then uh, indeed it will take me at least the hour. Uh, uh, hundreds of kilometers of roads are being established uh, illegally in order to reach these outposts. And uh, some of the consequences of these roads is that they're also uh, you know, a barrier from Palestinians to cross them. So once you have a road, it prevents shepherds to enter these areas. So and another extension, and of course, makes the access to the outposts and settlements much easier. Uh, 20, more than 24,000 dunams of land have been confiscated through a process called Declaration of State Land. Uh, just to put this in sort of proportions, since the 1990s, uh, 50,000 uh, 50, dunams of land have been expropriated in this way. So in the in this year alone, uh, half of them have been expropriated. So 24,000 dunams have been expropriated through declaration of state land uh, this year alone. That's a huge number. And, and of course, the, after you declare land as state land, there, it, this is an initial and important step to allocate them later to settlements. And of course, we must also say that many of these lands uh, are... Uh, Palestinian private land, and of course, many of these lands, you know, Palestinians claim that they're they're private lands, and it's again a comp uh, maybe a, a complicated process that if you want we can explain more. But this is very dramatic in, in the takeover taking over of Palestinian lands. Uh, the usual things, but also in very high figures, uh, nearly ten thousand housing units have been advanced through uh, uh, planning procedures. The establishment of five new settlements since the war began alone, uh, etc. Uh, I want to say two other things. One of them I hinted, uh, and, but one of, them, one of them I didn't. And the first is that for the first time, this government is funding outposts directly. Uh, now, it, they have been funding outposts in the past, but now this government is, they legislated that they had a, a, a government decision, and this is now taking place, that they're saying, you know, we have, we, they created a list where almost all of the outposts are there, and they said, oh, if these outposts are on this list, then we're going to directly fund them. So now for the first time ever, you have ministries from the Israeli government who are not doing it covertly. They're not disguising it. They're just directly funding illegal outposts. Again, illegal also according to Israeli laws, not just international law. Uh, the other thing is that I hinted about is the control over Area B, where we saw that now there's also uh, the Israeli military is taking itself sort of the... Uh, the authorities or responsibilities for demolishing of Palestinian houses in some places in Area B, but also the establishment of this new outpost that we've just seen. Two other things, and I'll run them quickly. One of them is, and of course, you know, Celine and Michael can also, you know, detail in detail about this. But this is the de-euro annexation. For the first time, we saw that authorities from the military have been transferred to an Israeli ministry. The Israel basically established a ministry for settlements. This ministry has a minister. 
it has a ministry and has civil servants. Uh, there, it's under sort of uh, you know a misleading term like a ministry within the Ministry of Defense. But nevertheless, Minister Smotrich is the Ministry of Settlements and he established the Settlement Division, which is his ministry. And he has civil ministers, uh, civil uh, civil servants, and he has legal advisors. And for the first time, there are legal advisors that are civil Israeli civil servants who act for the benefit of the Israeli uh, society and under the authorities of an Israeli minister in the occupied territories. This is something new. While in the same territory, you still have uh, soldiers or officers who are legal advisors who are taking responsibility for Palestinian matters or for security affairs. Uh, the last but not least, of course, is the financial things. And, and here, I, 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 don't, I won't go into details, but we are monitoring systematically the finances that this government is giving to settlement issues, and the numbers are really high. I don't know if you can, we don't have, we can't sort of uh, give them in, you know, we can't, uh, there, we can't compare it to previous uh, times, but these are figures that we, you know, are unimaginable. And also in the context of what we're at, you know, Israel is un, is in war, and a lot of its resources are going to this war. Is they, they cannot, The economy of Israel is not in a good place, and yet, the issue of settlements is being funded as never before. Uh, hundreds of million of shekels are going directly to settlements, to settler organizations, or to settler issues like settlement education and, and, and ideology and stuff like that, including illegal outposts, including billions of shekels to roads and infrastructure, etc. And really briefly, I'll end with the consequences. The first and, and immediate consequences, of course, on Palestinian lives and Palestinian livelihood, uh, you know, since the war alone, 19 Palestinian communities have been, uh, uh, you know, have, have left their communities, have, uh, due, have been evicted from their communities due to settler violence. I didn't even speak about settler violence, but there's a lot to say because that extended dramatically during this period. And maybe we can, in the discussion, to talk about it. But 19 communities have left their homes, their lands uh, since the war began. Uh, and... Uh, and again, if you travel the West Bank, and our Settlement Watch does this on a regular basis, you see Palestinian communities are trapped in their villages. There are many roadblocks. You know, the military is there, the settlements are there, the settlers are there, uh, and it's uh, and, and it's uh, so they're they're trapped in their own communities. And of course, uh, you mentioned the stats about the Palestinians that were killed uh, since the war began, but also how the militias have extended quite a lot since the war began. And the second one is what reflects, you know, uh, is the annexation. There, you know, annexation is happening in full speed through the de jure annexation, through the de facto annexation. And this is where we're, we're heading to. And this is, of course, affecting uh, the Israeli society and the state of Israel directly. Uh, we're moving from a place where, you know, we can proudly say, you know, this is a democracy, whether we're fighting for a democracy, to a situation where they're leading us to. No, uh, this is annexation, and the consequences, of course, of annexation is apartheid, because when they're annexing the territories without the, the, the people, without giving them rights, then, of course, it's it's apartheid. And, and this is what we're seeing on, on steroids. And, and I'll, I'll end here, but on all of these, of course, we can, we can expand and, and go into further details. Thanks so much. Uh, that was that was an incredibly rich uh, and important description, Lior. And I I do want to stay with you for uh, for a moment before uh, I move next to uh, Michael Svard. Um, I do see in the Q and A where we have many many questions already. There were a few things that I just want to put to you to clarify. Uh, that folks have asked, and when when someone asks something, there are usually other folks also uh, who want some clarification. So let me just uh, allow you to do that. Let me a few clarifying questions. One, uh, you mentioned a substantial number of Palestinian communities have had to flee. Uh, there was a, a request to repeat the number, so that's one thing. Um, and then question of whether new outposts are being guarded or defended by the IDF, if you could talk about that a little bit. Uh, and just a clarifying question that we got, uh, if you could just quickly speak to the difference between an outpost and a settlement. So we have those kind of like clarifying questions. And then the one other thing I'd like you to do before we move on to Mikhail is just connect the dots a little bit between settlements outposts and settler violence okay 
So oh, huge, important, great questions. I'll try to really make them quickly. Uh, uh, since the war, the, so we have a lot, we have about, you know, the figures differ, but there are about 300,000 Palestinians in Area C. Uh, these are Palestinians that are still under direct control of the Israeli military. Uh, they're not under in the control directly of the Palestinian Authority. And these many of these communities who are in Area C, if not most of them, are not recognized by the Israeli military or by the state of Israel as uh, as the official communities. And settlers, and especially the violent settlers and the outposts, one of their purposes is to uh, evacuate them, to take over control of the territories and also uh, prevent these communities uh, from being at their place. They want to sort of close on on them. And before the war, we saw uh, a few communities that had enough of settler violence and sort of left their lands. And since the war began, especially in the beginning of the war, but it's happening to, to this day. So recently, some other communities have, have had this. They've just fled, fled their area because they're under constant terror of settler violence. And, you know, these communities, they have no one to call for. They, you know, they're supposed to get protection by the military, which are not getting... There's no law enforcement that's effect or there's no effective law enforcement on settler violence. And so they're living under this, you know, complete uh, 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 in a state where they have no defense and no protection. And eventually they decided to 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 leave. And you see the connection uh, of and, and, and the reason is, of course, settler violence. Now, you asked about settler violence and and the main point of settler violence is that it's a tool to achieve political ends. And you know Israel and settler groups have many ways of taking over Palestinian land, and they have many ways of establishing settlements and to to annex the territories and to make them part and so on and so on. One of the ways is settler violence, and we've seen it since the beginning of the occupation, but it accelerated dramatically and it increased severely in recent months and years. And since the war, perhaps it's at a high point that we've never seen it before. You know the pogrom that we saw in Hawara uh, is has happened several times. They're not blunt about it. It's, you know, it, it is being sometimes sort of, uh, uh, you know, condemned uh, by Israeli ministers or from the military, but it's a rare event when it happens. And nevertheless, it's, it's, it still goes on. It goes on and the consequences are, uh, are none to the settlers who do it or very limited. On the contrary, it's beneficial for them because it's achieving their political end. You're seeing Palestinians are hiding back, you know, are, it's it's effective. You know, it's taking, it, we saw 19 communities have left due to that. And and maybe in a word, settlements and outposts are Israeli communities that have been established or that are established in the, in the West Bank. Uh, settlements are recognized by the government of Israel. Outposts are not. Uh, both are illegal according to the international law, but uh, Israel makes this distinction, distinction between them uh, for several reasons. Uh, and nevertheless, uh, this is what this phenomenon is, is. This is what it is. Thank you so much for, for that, Lior. Extremely important and helpful stuff. Um, I do want to turn now to Michal Svard and, uh, and discuss the ICJ, International Court of Justice, ruling uh, that happened over the summer. Michal, I know I personally... Uh, when the ruling came down, the first thing that I wanted to know was what Mikhail Sfard would say about it and its significance, because you really are the expert. So let's just dive right into it. And Mikhail, uh, tell us what, you know, the main components of this decision. Uh, and I just want to note that, you know, you have written, you have written about it. Uh, and specifically, you called the ICJ ruling a legal earthquake in slow motion. So tell us about that. Thank you, Deborah, and thank you for having us. Um, it's really exciting to see so many people um, in the midday in, in America um, logging in um, to hear about these issues. It, it's heartwarming, and we need reasons to get our hearts warm these days. <clears throat> the International Court of Justice decision is uh, um, has uh, three components. Um, the first one, um, first of all, it has to be said that the that it's I called it a ruling, but it's an advisory opinion. So, uh, the International Court of Justice is the supreme judicial organ of the United Nations. It is the most authoritative 
um, judicial entity in the world on international law. And when uh, an organ of the United Nations asks it for an advisory opinion, this advisory opinion is binding in the legal sense. It is not an order, it's not an injunction like in contentious cases, but the reasoning and the interpretation of international law that the court provides is binding uh, under international law. So the General Assembly has asked the court two questions. One is to um, qualify the and 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 name or analyze the the legal status the Israeli occupation can now be seen as. So what are we seeing? What is, in legal terms, the Israeli domination of the Palestinian territory? And the second question is basically, once the court has um, reached a conclusion about the first question, what does that conclusion mean in terms of obligations? of third parties, of the United Nations, of the international community as a whole, and of member states. What are their obligations towards the situation that the court has uh, um, has described in its, in its uh, response to the first question? Well, the court has made three dramatic assertions, and, 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 and I, I can't, uh, um, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's, I cannot overestimate or um, or exaggerate in the uh, importance of the court's rulings. And in a moment, I'll say why. So the first assertion is that the Israeli presence in the occupied Palestinian territory, which means the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and the Gaza Strip, is unlawful. It is unlawful because... Israel has abused the powers international law of belligerent occupation provided it, the, the, the powers that are meant for Israel to be able to administer the occupied territory temporarily and until a permanent um, solution is find, found for the conflict. It abused the, those powers in order to frustrate the very goals, the very uh, um, the the object and the purpose, the international laws of belligerent occupation are there to achieve. So, international law of belligerent occupation um, has ha has uh, a goal, and the goal is to make sure that occupation and wars do not end with permanent domination, permanent control over the occupied territory by the occupying state or the occupying power. The reason for that is that after 1945 and the establishment of the United Nations on the ashes of two world wars and the catastrophic uh, uh, Holocaust, the international community has made a decision to outlaw wars of aggression, to outlaw the use of force in international relations. And in order to make sure that force is not used, we need to de-incentivize states from using force. And how do you do it if not by making sure that force does not lead to acquiring sovereignty over new territory? And so the international laws of belligerent occupation were designed to make sure that on the one hand, the occupier may administer temporarily the territory, but it will not make any earnings from that. It will not bear fruit. It will not create uh, 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 sovereignty. And the court has reached the conclusion that Israel has violated, has, uh, has, has breached these uh, uh, very important uh, prohibitions, and most notably by, uh, its, uh, by its settlement enterprise. So... The first assertion of the court is that the Israeli presence is unlawful, and the court goes on to say, and it must end, quote unquote, as rapidly as possible. The second assertion is that Israel has violated the prohibition on annexation. It annexed East Jerusalem, and it is annexing the Area C in, 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 in both de jure and de facto, and this is not a violation of one another prohibition 
among, uh, among many others uh, in international law. It is a violation of the most fundamental prohibition, one that is uh, the cornerstone of the international, uh, uh, international rule-based order of the post-Second World War. And the third, and probably the most radical, the most surprising uh, 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 assertion of the International Court of Justice is that it went on to ask itself, what is the character of the Israeli regime that was created in uh, uh, the occupied Palestinian territory? And, it, and, and since it found that it has the, as a key feature, the discrimination, the systemic and systematic discrimination of Palestinians uh, and the, the takeover of all the resources and allocation of those resources to the settlers, to the Israeli settlers on the expense of Palestinians, that there, are, there is a dual legal system with Israeli modern uh, liberal laws that uh, govern Israelis, apply to Israelis, and military draconian law that governs their neighbors, the Palestinians. The court in the most dramatic and really most uh, uh, amazing a, a segment of its uh, advisor opinion says Israel has violated Article 3 of CERD. CERD is the, Con the International Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. Now, Article 2 of CERD says that racial discrimination is wrong and unlawful. Article 3 says that the most abhorrent types of racial discrimination are racial segregation and apartheid. And the court said, this is the article that we Israelis are violating. Each judge then goes on in its uh, independent uh, statement to say which of the two they think Israel violates. Some of them say, it's really an apartheid. We have reached a, a moment we have to call a spade a spade. This is an apartheid regime in the occupied Palestinian territory. The court does not deal with Israel proper. And others said, well, it's not. we don't know if it's apartheid. It's only... <laughs> racial segregation, you know, as an Israeli, as a Jew, uh, I mean, this is the most embarrassing, the most shameful moment, the lowest moment we've reached when the highest court in, in the world says that we are engaging in racial discrimination, racial segregation, and maybe even in apartheid. I am of the opinion that, there, that we are committing the crime of apartheid. Now, then, after these three assertions, the court goes on to say, to answer the second question, it says, all states in the world are under obligation to review, reassess their dealings with Israel and make sure that none of them, directly or indirectly, does not contribute to the Israeli presence in the West Bank. This is not a geographic, art, a, a, a geographic a, a, a article. That's not enough to say we will not have joint project in the occupied territory with Israel. It's not enough because Israel is in a process, as Lior rightly said, a process of annexation. And the process of annexation means that Israeli governmental authorities are now give, are being given uh, uh, powers, the administrative powers in the West Bank. So even if a certain uh, uh, a project is done in Israel proper, but with an Israeli public authority, it may contribute to the Israeli presence in the West Bank. So this is an amazing thing. And the last thing I want to say about the, the ruling or the opinion is that the court goes on even further to say that Israel is under obligation to make reparations to the Palestinians in many forms, in forms of restitution, allowing them back to where they were. The, the court has a huge segment on, on forced displacement. Lior talked about it. I mean, the forced displacement of full communities, of hamlets, uh, nine, according to B'Tselem figures, since October 7th, 19 communities were entirely displaced, but 12 more were partially displaced. And they were all displaced through violence, through intimidation, through coercive measures that were uh, imposed on them. So why do I say that this is an earthquake in slow motion? I, I call it an earthquake in, 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 in an op-ed that I wrote uh, in, uh, for Don. Don is the uh, Democratic uh, for the Arab World Now organization, which I serve as uh, non-resident uh, fellow uh, for, um, when, when a domestic court makes a ruling, someone goes to prison or someone pays another the debt they owe that the court has acknowledged. So there is, a, there is an enforcement process very clear. There's a, 
uh, uh, police. There are many others uh, enforcement uh, uh, authorities, and there is an immediate uh, uh, consequence. International law uh, works differently. It works through its agents. The good uh, um, deep state of international law are the legal advisors in the governments around the world. Le the, the, the lawyers who give advice to executive, to governmental ministries, to authorities, to legislators, and some and, and judges who, who, who make judgments and rulings in domestic courts, they all have are entrusted with the task of interpreting the advisory opinion and make and 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 uh, uh, advising their bosses, or if it's uh, uh, judges, then uh, issuing orders that would implement the uh, the the assertions of the court uh, uh, domestically. So what we're see, seeing now is many many countries are reevaluating their relations with Israel, trying to understand what it means when we have trade agreements, when we have commercial. Uh, um, cultural uh, relationships with Israel, how that will be implemented. That's why I'm saying it's, it, it takes time. It moves like a cloud that takes it time, but eventually it, it reaches and, 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 and it, it darkens uh, 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 um, the ground. Um, and and uh, uh, we will have to see in coming days and weeks how the world will react to the uh, very important uh, advisory opinion because, and I'll end with this, Deborah. what is amazing in recent weeks for lawyers like me that wish that the law would be not only a sword that um, hurts people, but also will make, will stand to its calling and ha and be, be a shield from, from evil is that I think, and I'm follow, you know, I'm I'm following very closely the law of the conflict for the last three decades. The last few weeks, the last few months, the law international has made an appearance in the in the stage of the of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, with two proceedings at the ICJ, the South African uh, uh, lawsuit, and and the advisor opinion with the. Uh, uh, um, with the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court filing of motions for arrest warrants against uh, uh, Netanyahu and Gallant and against the Hamas leaders, suddenly we have a new actor. It's not only the Americans and the EU and the Arabs and the Palestinians very weak and Israel, of course. It's not only economy and, and military power. Suddenly we have a new dude, and that's the international law. It's not a decisive, he, it's not like a, 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 a nuclear power, but it's a novelty. And that, and we'll, we'll see in coming days and weeks and months and years, how that will play off. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Michael. Um, and there's a lot that we could do to, to follow up regarding the International Court of Justice. And I hope, I hope we'll have some some time for that. We're trying to discuss a lot within this webinar. And on that note, um, I do want to note because someone put into the Q&A, oh no, we need to go past an hour. There's, there's so much we need to discuss. We are going to, uh, this is a 75 minute webinar. So we do have about half an hour left. So we're, we're not done yet. We do still have some more time, just a programming note to let folks know. Um, one thing that I did want to mention very quickly, that the little thing I wanted to add about um, the ICJ International Court of Justice uh, decision, which, which I personally found very interesting, uh, was that there was a very high degree of concordance among the justices, and specifically that the U.S. judge, Sarah Cleveland, uh, voted with the majority on all of the different provisions um, right. that Michal Sfar just laid out for us, which I, I do think is pretty significant. And also okay. the German judge, Nolte, which is okay. also a, a, it's also a, state, a very important statement. Absolutely. No, no question about that. Okay. So um, we are going, I want to make sure to bring in our third panelist, Celine Tuboul, um, and she's going to help us walk through some of the policy questions here. 
Um, and so going back to Celine, if we go back to the question of settler violence um, and, and what the Netanyahu government has done about it, might do about it, if anything, I think it's worth noting that we have heard from very senior security officials, even from uh, people like General Yehuda Fox, who uh, was the, uh, the head of Israel's Central Command, which is in charge of the West Bank, even from Ronan Barr, uh, who is the former head of the Shin Bet, uh, who have called, Ronan Barr called settler violence Jewish terrorism. They have called on the Israeli government to uh, take this seriously and in fact to address it. Uh, and I wonder if you might talk a little bit about uh, Celine, whether the, the Israeli government has done or is likely to do anything to take those calls seriously and address the phenomenon. Thanks, Deborah, and uh, thanks for inviting me to that panel. Um, I, I think that you pointed at something important uh, that I wanted to address regarding the terminology that uh, uh, Israeli officials, the head of Shin Bet, the uh, chief of staff, have been using when uh, looking at this phenomenon. Um, and, and it's not new because, um, so they, they have used the word terrorism. Um, and, and also institutionally within the Shin Bet, um, this phenomenon has been called for many years uh, Jewish terror. Um, and the U.S. administration has been more shy to use that term. Now, it's not a semantic question. When you frame an action as terrorism, you stop dealing with it as an isolated element. You look at it as an organized um, violence. Um, and these are not criminals. These are terrorism. The, the legal tools to address that are different. Uh, it, it, it opened other possibility, not only for um, law enforcement in Israel, but also I think for the international community when looking at it. Now, Israel has tried to argue for many years that these acts uh, of violence are sporadic, are of radical individual that do not necessarily represent uh, the settler community, um, and, and maybe indeed that's the case. Maybe these are a, a, you know, a, a, a marginal part of the settler community, but that's not the point. The point, I think, is when you treat that as just individual, you fail to see that the government has been backing and it's citing uh, uh, these acts. Um, and basically, more importantly, I I have failed to instruct law enforcement agencies, the IDF and the police uh, to do anything about it. Uh, so we often look with a lot of frustration, IDF soldier standing um, next to settler and not doing anything. Um, and, and these are indeed very problematic um, image. Uh, what we fail to understand is that the IDF is uh, working under uh, you know, direction from uh, the political echelon, uh, which and the Minister of Defense have never ordered the IDF to draw a plan and monitoring the effectiveness of its action against um, uh, uh, against uh, this type of terrorism. Um, and, and I think that when we look at what will be required uh, to address uh, this phenomenon is indeed looking at what the US administration can do is to challenge more directly the political issue, uh, not only for not doing enough, but for inciting um, this action uh, and the bodies and institution that are behind them. Um, and basically not saying anything when our prime minister uh, that is challenged on this issue will say, well, the law has to be respected everywhere in the West Bank and in uh, the highway in Tel Aviv. Now, why is saying highway in Tel Aviv? Because he's referring to the demonstrator. 
uh, that have been demonstrating against his government um, and that are blocking the highway. And he's doing a parallelism between terrorist acts that have been killed Palestinian and um, uh, destroying their property and a demonstrator that block a highway. This, in my view, is, it should be framed as incitement because when you draw that line, you basically legitimate this action. And, and this is something in my view that has not been uh, um, sufficiently enough, uh, sorry, uh, not just, you know, as an individual act of violence, uh, but, but as a more systematic and organized um, uh, phenomenon. Thank you so much for that, Celine. Um, I, I'd love for you, in terms of policy, I'd love to get your thoughts um, on the U.S. government. Uh, we obviously play an enormous role vis-a-vis uh, -vis the situation in Israel-Palestine, whether it's in the West Bank, Gaza, both. Um, and a lot of our a lot of our folks in the Q and A are asking, uh, what more can and should the U.S. be doing? Um, a lot of different options on the table. Some folks are asking about arms shipments and in what way they can or should be used. Uh, we have folks also asking about U.S. response to uh, the court, uh, the ICJ rulings, the actions being taken by the ICC prosecutor. Uh, any thoughts that you have, wherever you know you would, however you might, if you were advising the U.S. government. Uh, suggest that the U.S. go in order to impact what is happening on the ground? Okay. So the first is what uh, what I said, and it's about, and it's not only about settler violence, it's uh, uh, about in general the Israeli policy and to call it for what it is. Uh, so instead of, you know, picking each individual action uh, when Israel, you know, uh, um, build an outpost, expand settlements, um, and, and look at this action as, as isolated element. So word that has been missing in that conversation is annexation. And, uh, and, and, and Michael uh, uh, pointed that, um, that uh, we have long passed the creeping de facto annexation. I think that some of the measures that the Israeli government has undertaken recently are the building block of annexation. It's important, I think, that the president and the administration will use that word, also because it can help trigger an internal debate in Israel. Um, because there has not been a formal decision by the government to annex the territory. And, and we know that the majority of the Israeli public oppose the annexation of the territory. And, and therefore, it's important to, I think, uh, instead of looking each time as, you know, uh, uh, bureaucratic um, and, and isolated action to 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 look at a better picture and, and the ramification. Uh, another point, uh, and, and it relates also to the perception in, in Israel, uh, a majority of the public in Israel ignores, ignores or fail to understand the inherent link between the current violence in the West Bank, the situation in Gaza, and the ability to move towards an end uh, uh, of the war in a way that will, you know, provide greater security for Israel uh, and 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 address, uh, uh, you know, the the uh, core of the, the tragedy that uh, Israel have faced on October seven. Now, as the Israeli public is still struggling with that trauma and desperately hope for a way out, I think it is critical to clarify to Israeli leader and to the public the consequence of the current trajectory. Israel's policy in the West Bank and Jerusalem will directly undermine the ability of Israel to ever normalize relations with the region. It will undermine Israel's peace treaty with Jordan and Egypt, and it will undermine Israel's ability to end the war in Gaza as no regional or international actor will support a broad Gaza stabilization effort when Israel moves towards annexation in the West Bank and continue to kind of uh, uh, re refuse uh, to, to change policy. And to show how these issues are interlinked, because we, we discussed today the West Bank and you outlined in, in your opening remark uh, 
that, well, we discussed a little bit about Gaza, so now talk about the West Bank. Both are interlinked. You cannot address one issue if you don't address the other one. And, and there is deep misunderstanding in Israel about that. So if there was something that I think the president uh, should do is to articulate better the link between this issue so that there is a, a, a more um, uh, um, constructive discussion in Israel uh, and legitimacy for those that call for a shift of policy. Thank you so much for that. Uh, really, really appreciate that. And, and really appreciate you also connecting the dots between what's happening in the West Bank and Gaza and the ramifications. Um, that is that is absolutely very important. Um, so I want to throw out uh, a couple of questions and really kind of let our panelists, uh, as they would like to, decide to, to grab on uh, to one or more of them. Um, and so, and, and these go to the questions that were, uh, some of the questions that we're seeing uh, get repeated in the Q&A and that are clearly on folks' minds. Um, and there are a number of questions that revolve around Israeli public opinion. Questions regarding uh, to what extent Israelis are really aware of what is going on in the West Bank vis-a-vis -vis settlements, outposts, settler violence, you know, expansion of settlements. Uh, and how do, how do Israelis feel about what is going on in the West Bank? We know that there are massive protests uh, that are, you know, especially since the the execution of the six Israeli hostages, including Hirsch Goldberg, Poland, uh, which is, of course, atrocious. We know that there were huge protests that were going on even before October 7th, vis-a-vis -vis the judicial coup. Um, you know, to what extent is there any possibility that that these huge protests might have an impact on the dynamics that we're seeing vis-a-vis -vis the occupation? So there's that whole set of questions. Uh, revolving around the Israeli public. Um, uh, additional questions. We have questions, so that's that's kind of one set of questions. We have questions about uh, Palestinian extremism uh, and the, the rise in support for armed groups within the West Bank by Palestinians since October 7th, uh, and whether the Israeli government, the IDF, has been able to effectively address that. Is there anything that the United States should be doing about that. Uh, that's another question. And then uh, regarding the ICJ, we've had some questions regarding that, uh, and including one of the one of the issues there is that uh, we know that the UN General Assembly is set to consider a resolution that's being put forth by the Arab group. Uh, record, regarding the ICJ, it, it even has a six-month timeline for Israel to pull out of the occupied territories. Uh, Mikhail, if you if you could, maybe you're the obvious one to answer this, anything additional that you could tell us about that and what you see as the impact? Uh, so really, you know, three sets of quite a lot of, lot of stuff here and all of that, but who would like to jump in first? And I'm going to let you kind of pick what you want to tackle. I'll start. And I'll I'll connect your last question to Celine about America, about the American administration uh, with the issue of Palestinian extremism, and then I'll say a word about uh, UN General Assembly. Look, I, I will be blunt. America is the enabler of the Israeli occupation, has always been the enabler, and it is still the enabler. America has a lot of power and um, uh, it doesn't use it to, uh, to bring an end to the occupation. Um, and one of the issues that uh, has to be changed dramatically, hopefully in the next administration, is that the policy must be such that will provide successes to the current Palestinian nonviolent leadership. The PA has made a strategic decision, Abu Mazen has made a strategic decision at the end of the horrendous Second Intifada, horrendous for Israelis, but most of, of all horrendous for, for the Palestinians. And that is to continue the Palestinian struggle for independence and freedom 
through nonviolent means, through law, through diplomacy, and continue until this very day the security cooperation with Israel in a way that saves Israeli lives. And Abu Mazen and his PA has received in return nothing, nothing but humiliation and not a single tangible success that he can show his people that this road works. And I don't want to say that this is why we had October 7, but, but the fact that Palestinian young Palestinians who want who are born into occupation don't want to die being occupied, want to feel some form of independence and freedom in their lives, turn to extremism is definitely partially because the other way doesn't prove to be to be uh, to yield any fruits. Has the American administration even considered re recognition of Palestinian state? Has it considered to, with, to, to, to shut down its embassy in, in Jerusalem? These are things that the that, that Trump administration has done. Why couldn't the Biden administration uh, 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 redo them? Not to mention other things that are more tangible for the daily life of Palestinians in the West Bank. So when we talk about extremism, yes, there are the, the, the Palestinian society will have to, when it once the occupation and apartheid will end and, 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 and Palestinians will be free and independent, they will have to look back and think very thoroughly on the means of, of struggles that some of the fractions have, have, have used, definitely. But we also have a share in driving Palestinians to extremism. Now, um, regarding the UN General Assembly, so the um, and the American administration, by the way, was embarrassing one of the only uh, uh, um, um, governments that asked the, the the ICJ actually to not render a uh, uh, an advisory opinion. Why? Because it will ruin the peace process. Come on, what peace process? So um, the ICJ has um, has made all the um, assertions that I described before, and then went on to say that the way that Israel, the modalities in which the uh, uh, the, the opinion will be implemented, the modalities in which Israel would end its presence in the occupied Palestinian territory, is something for the United Nations General Assembly and for the United. United Nations Security Council uh, uh, to discuss and to decide on. Uh, and that's why the Palestinians and the Arab group are bringing to the General Assembly um, a draft resolution that adopts uh, the uh, advisory opinion as a whole, but also one goes on to suggest some kind of modality. The ICJ did not say what does it mean as rapidly as possible, how much time is as rapidly as possible. So uh, in as far as I understand in the uh, uh, draft resolution, they indicate six months. But as you all know, um, the General Assembly resolutions are not binding. Uh, what is binding is Security Council resolutions. And here we go back to the permanent uh, member, uh, America that only in the lame duck period of Obama was ready to um, not to veto a decision in the, in, the, in the Security Council that actually calls a spade a spade and, and talks about the occupation as illegal and, and demands that Israel uh, stops confiscating land and so on and so forth. That's uh, 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 a resolution, uh, Security Council Resolution 2334 from December of, of 2016. But it's about time that America will use more, um, more selectively its veto power to defend Israel and use it in order to push Israel to the right direction. Um, and so while the General Assembly resolution is extremely uh, important, and it's very important to see who will vote for it, whether the EU as a whole will vote for it, whether the UK will vote for it, uh, and what will America do, what will the US do, um, at the end of the day, if it doesn't reach the Security Council, uh, then it has much less uh, 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 impact uh, on the ground. Thank you so much. Um, I do want to, we're, we're getting questions in the Q&A about 
how folks can access the webinar uh, later after later today after we conclude it. So I'll just ask my colleagues to to put that link again into uh, the chat. Can't hurt to do that. Um, uh, so I do want to give both Celine and Lior a chance also to to answer whatever of these questions that they would like to, uh, and ask you to do that in five minutes or less. Uh, so why don't Celine? Should we should we turn to you next? Sure, I will be very short because I think uh, uh, Michael said a very important thing uh, that I wanted to say regarding the Palestinian Authority um, and its commitment to nonviolence. Um, and indeed, the fact that uh, uh, the, the PA has not been rewarded, uh, by the way, not only by the US administration, uh, we should look first at the Israeli government uh, that has uh, made the strategic decision um, to see in Hamas a more important uh, partner than in the Palestinian Authority. Um, so to, to echo what um, Michael sa said, uh, but to add one thing, because I realize that when we say the PA, um, more specifically also maybe for US audience, um, there is you know a lot of res reservation because the PA is not a perfect entity. It is a corrupted entity and uh, it has many flows. Um, and, and, and there has been like very strong call for the PA to reform. Um, and, and it's a valid demand, uh, but there is a but, uh, which relate to what Michael has said. Um, the demand for reform should not be a condition for the PA to be a player. Uh, and, now, and, and indeed we should recognize that Basically, the more uh, um, the Palestinian Authority, and even more specifically, uh, uh, Mahmoud Abbas uh, is weak, the more is um, resisting any pressure to do anything that in his view will compromise his control that is already very, you know, evaporating um, over the Palestinian Authority and, and the territories. Um, I'm not saying that his um, uh, that his action are legitimate, uh, but I think that we should understand the price of weakness and the ramification of weakness. Um, and, and therefore, even if I support uh, the demand that the PA should reform, um, I think it's important that this should be done in parallel and in synchronization with a shift of policy by Israel in the West Bank. Um, and so when, for example, Michael mentions the recognition of a Palestinian state, I think one of the things that I have tried to emphasize to the state that have been considering that, um, uh, that step um, is that if we want that to be constructive, it should be you know, part of a roadmap that say, okay, in one year, we'll give you recognition. Uh, but this is what you are expected to do in this year. One, two, three, four, five. And then when you do that, you actually achieve something that is not only, by the way, a, a talking point or uh, um, uh, is, is something that will ultimately strengthen the Palestinian Authority, also vis-a-vis -vis its own people. So uh, I think that both uh, uh, process should run parallel, uh, but indeed that, that should start by uh, 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 acting in a way that reward nonviolence uh, rather than violence. Great. And so we're going to turn to Lior Amichai for, for the last word. And Lior, if, if you would like to, I also want to invite you uh, to address the question of President Biden's executive order uh, and the sanctions that the U.S. has levied uh, against certain violent settlers, outposts, a uh, couple of entities so far, what you think about that. And, and you know, noting that J Street is now calling for sanctions against uh, Minister Smotrich, Ben Gvir, and some other key entities. Uh, if you did want to render any thoughts on that, uh, we'd certainly welcome it. So putting you on the spot just a little bit, Lior. So the, the answer is that I do, uh, but I want to speak more about the first question that you asked about the Israeli public opinion. So I won't ignore it because I have a lot to say about the sanctions, but I'll just say, read the J Street recommendations. And yes, we recommend them as well. And I think that if the sanctions will move 
to larger organizations and more effective ones, this will be much more effective because so far it's been symbolic, it's been really important, but it had very limited effect on the ground. So if we move on to groups like Amana and Rigavim, you mentioned them, J Street, that would be really important. Uh, I want to talk about the Israeli public opinion. Uh, and this is from sort of me being first and foremost an Israeli citizen, but also being, you know, the director of peace now for the last year and a half. And the first and foremost, I think, feeling that the most dominant feeling that the Israeli society at large is feeling right now is depression, despair, and, and fear. Uh, you know, we are, we're in this war. We, are, we don't know where it will lead us, where the state of Israel will be in a few years, if it will be in a few years. And we really fear uh, that this will escalate, you know, to a larger war and to what this place will be, if it will be a state, a democracy, and thing. That is, that is the most dominant feeling on everybody's level, I think. I'll be like, I'll dare to, to speak. Uh, the other thing that is, uh, is also a bad thing that is that there's complete, almost complete ignorance of what's happening to the Palestinians, especially in Gaza. We just don't know. We don't care. If, you know, it, 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 and that's like the good, the positive thing, but the, the negative thing is it's most, most, most of the time it's justified completely. Uh, and so we either we, do, we are ignorant or we support it and we justify it. Uh, having said that, there is two, I think, positive things uh, on the emotional level. One is that there is a lot of anger on this government for uh, the abandonment of the Israeli society, of you know the way that they're treating the hostages, the people in the north, the people in the south, uh, you know their uh, their priorities, and even the way you know the public debate is being handled and corruption. So there's a lot of anger, real authentic anger by the Israeli society. Uh, the other emotion, which is I think is also very much dominant, is of shame, and that is especially directed to Smotrich and Benkvir, and you know settler violence is. One of the most is one of the issues that there's a consensus across the board in the Israeli society that we have to condemn it. We feel shame, shameful. So not all the Israelis go to, you know, to Zanuta and safeguard Palestinian communities from settler violence, but almost the entire Israeli society feels ashamed of this, you know, uh, very efficient and powerful minority that does the settler violence and the fact that Israel is not preventing them. And they're ashamed of Ben Gvir and they're ashamed of Smotrich for representing them. In, in government. Intellectually speaking, I think, and we're seeing this from polls, I think there's also an understanding that this war has to end. Uh, and not, not just, you know, we're, we're seeing it now in the demands of the protests, first and foremost, to safeguard the hostages. You know, if Israel won't return them through an agreement, at least end the war to, so they'll be safe, you know, that, you know, that eventually when they'll return, they'll be alive. Uh, so there is a demand to end the war and an understanding that it has to end in order to safeguard the Israeli hostages that are, you know, geez, you know, 300 and so many days in Gaza right now. I think there's also an understanding, again, polls are showing this, that in Israelis understand, the majority of the Israelis, in a sense, certainly from the liberal camp, the center camp, not only the, the left, that this war can only end uh, with a political agreement, you know, a military war is not, you know, we can't win this war military alone. We have to have a political agreement. Otherwise, it's a bloodbath and it will be a, a forever war. And, and that is that is necessary to end the war. And I think there's also an understanding that the international relations with the U.S. specifically, but also with the entire world is extremely important. You know, the 7th of October, Israelis felt uh, you know, fear that we're just, you know, that the entire, you know, Iran and, and, and you know, the, and we'll just, you know, be trapped and it'll, it'll be end of the war. It will be the end of Israel through military means. And the American actions immediately after the war sort of gave Israel some feeling of relief. OK, we're not alone. We can't be entirely on ourselves. And I think if you take these emotions, this is what we have to build on uh, as a as, you know, as policy, as a society. And and to understand that if we want to get out of this mess. Uh, you know, this is the Israeli state. And I think that we also have to take this into uh, uh, understand that this is also the limitations of the Israeli society. Uh, I have a lot of hope in the Israeli society that we can do so much. And, you know, Israelis are protesting for five years now. 
against the Taniyahu, and then against the judicial, and now for the hostages, really showing a powerful movement of civil, you know, society, brave, courageous, we're being arrested, we're going, we're, we're not demonstrating once a week, several times a week for deep issues, you know, fighting, you know, against the police, against, so there's a lot, but it's also limited. And if, you know, and I'll, and I'll end with something that I hate to say, but I, I believe it, you know, this government has an agenda and they don't care. There is war and they're still funding settlements more than ever, although they have to give resources to the military, to the north, to the south, whatever. And, you know, now Smotrich and the settlers are campaigning to have settlements in Gaza. Could this be possible? Could you imagine an Israeli community in a refugee camp in Gaza, in Jabalia, near the Gaza Strip, you know, in the Gaza Strip near Gaza City? We can't. It's not. It can't work, right? We can't. But if we understand, and we, I mean, the Israeli society, but also the American policymakers, that you know, if we won't change things, if we do more of the same, or just slightly, you know, do things slightly different, if we won't understand that this is an in interest of everyone's, because the seventh of October showed us that this is not an Israeli-Palestinian conflict to sort out. This has consequences on the whole region, uh, then this will happen again. And I think we have to take, so to understand the limitations of each of us, you know, but also what uh, we have to strategic, strategically think how we must change policy in order to things, make things different, then things will change. And, and they have to, because really we don't have another choice. So with that, um... I am going to do what I what I always do at the end of our webinars, of course, is wrap up by thanking our speakers. Um, but in order to do that, I'm actually going to start off by reading a comment that one of our audience members wrote in the Q&A. He writes, thank you all for your commitment, your brilliance, your articulation of the issues. The work you are doing is very important. Thank you. And, and of course, I echo that one of the very favorite parts for me of my job uh, is getting to work with uh, brilliant and committed Israeli analysts and activists like yourselves who are doing incredibly difficult, but extremely important work. Um, and I just want you to know with, you know, well over 500 folks joining us to watch this webinar today, that you're not alone that we here in the United States greatly support and appreciate what you're doing. So thank you so much and keep up the extremely important work. And with that- Thank I'll you very much. Webinar. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you.